So what is truth? Does truth change with the seasons? Does truth adapt to cultural, economic, or social shifts? Is there a such thing as an absolute truth? Or is truth only relative to each individual for themselves? Many college professors teach and want their students to believe that there's no such thing as truth. News outlets and media hosts give their spin on the so-called true facts of an event. These spins on reality leaves us uh, as a society confused, worried, and uninformed. In the fast pace that we live in, this ever-changing world, it's hard for us to keep up at times. It seems like another bombshell is dropped in our lap every single day. With everything that's going on locally and nationally and even on the world stage, what is a person to do? Where can a person turn to for some sanity and truth? Friends, it may look like everything is spinning out of control in this world, but it is not. I can assure you that everything is under control and going according to plan. This chaos and confusion that we live in was predicted over 2,000 years ago by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the most part, people are unchanging. Although we may live in different parts of the world, and even live in different eras and different time periods, mankind as a whole has not changed all that much. Every civilization and every religion has asked the same questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose for living? And what happens to me when I die? There is only one source to all the so there's only one source for these answers to all these questions. And this is the word of God. This book is unchanging. This book does not adapt to its environment. The environment should adapt to the word of God. I believe this is the source of all truth. This is the unfallible, inerrant word of God that we can build our life upon. The Holy Bible is not just a book full of stories and anecdotes. It's a book of guidelines and, 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 a, and a rule book for us to live by. It's not to destroy our lives, but to build our lives. This same book has the ability to confound the intellect and the wise. But it's simple enough for an eight-year-old child to open up the pages and realize what it's saying to them. There's no other book on this planet that can change a person's life like this one. When searching for truth, you have to search no further. This book has outlasted every other book on the planet. And even though governors and presidents and kings and magistrates have tried to disband this book or d destroy this book and outlaw it, they were unable to do so because it has outlasted every single dynasty. Yes. And even though I can't understand every single bit of this book yet, I'm working on it. But even though I can't understand it, it doesn't mean I don't keep trying. This book has changed my life. The world that we live in right now is absolutely in a tailspin. But this book is solid. It's unchanging. There's things in our world that are shaking right now. But the truth is unshakable. I'm hoping this morning, before we even dive into the Word, you guys will understand that this book is the book to build your life upon. Jesus said it best when he says he is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that. That he is the truth. And the only thing that we can find that is unshakable is the kingdom of God. So the main reason why I want to start it out this message the way I have is because I want you to truly understand that the things we're going to discuss, there's a foundation there's a truth that is unshakable. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 24. I know many of you guys have studied this chapter over and over and over again. 
as you should. And I think it's important for us to keep going back to the same chapters and understand Jesus' own words of instruction and encouragement and wisdom and warning to the church of Jesus Christ. Here in 24, it gives a story of Jesus and his disciples just out for a walk one day. And as they were casually walking, Jesus just gives out a statement talking about the destruction of the temple. Now, Jesus didn't give a whole lot of instructions, but he gave enough for the disciples to chew on and to ponder on and say, there has to be more to this story than just what we were given. They chewed on that story for quite a while. Later on that afternoon, in verse 3, it says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus' answer can be found in the remaining verses of chapter 24 and some of the verses in chapter 25. And Jesus doesn't answer the first question as they asked. When he asked, when will this happen? He didn't give the time. He didn't give the dates. He didn't give all the answers that they were searching for. And many of us have asked that same question. When will this moment in time happen? When will Jesus split the sky and call the church home? The only answer that I can come up with right now is soon. Soon and very soon we will see the king. Until that moment of time takes place, we have a job to do. And even though it might get scary at times, our eyes can be focused on the king of all kings, the prince of peace himself, Jesus Christ. I like the fact that they asked for a sign here. And all of us have seen signs even on the way to church this morning, even within the church, you see signs. And signs can be shapes or symbols. I mean, if, we, if I show you the shape of an octagon, all of us would think, stop sign, even without it being painted red or the words written on there. We associate with signs all, over the, all, the, all the time. And God has used signs and wonders and, and miracles to speak to the church since the very, very beginning. I believe he does that so we're not misinformed, that we're not caught off guard. He uses these signs as a warning to the church to prepare us for the things to come. This warning that Jesus gives us is to prepare our hearts. Because it may not look real pretty outside. There may be some chaos in the streets. There may be some anarchy going on throughout America and throughout the world. But, God, but Jesus chose his words very carefully so the church will be informed and not cut off guard. As we continue reading in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 6, it says, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. You know, one of the most dangerous and outrageous things that the media has done and continues to do is the misinformation game. Misleading people has long been a tool for the enemy to dismay, to confuse, to, con just to scare God's people. We can see Satan using deception very early on in the Garden of Eden. That deception has been one of his favorite weapons to use. And unfortunately, many, if not all the media sources, have jumped onto this bandwagon of misinformation. And I don't care what news source you listen to or watch, be careful and guard your heart. The Lord God is warning us here in 24. You know, fear is a powerful weapon in those who want to do harm. Before the woke crowd changed the history books, some of you guys may have heard, the stories of the Crow Indians used to chase buffalo, surround them with the horses, and chase them to a cliff, causing panic to instill inside the, the, the massive herd of hooves and fur. 
scaring them into a panic and driving them off of a mountain to hopefully their death. But if they didn't get killed, they're severely maimed and injured, making them easy pickings for the Indians to, to finish off. Now, even though that was a very uh, useful tactic by the Indians, the enemy's using the same thing to cause panic within God's church, to cause us to jump out of windows and out of fear and run away from the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus understood the workings of a man's heart. As you know, God, Jesus was 100% God and 100% human while he walked this earth. So he understood how panic and fear will rise up inside of a person's heart. And he mentions the same phrase over three or four times in this chapter. And as chapters continue, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out. Church, that's the declaration I'm giving you to this morning is to watch out, be aware, open the book, open up the word of God so you understand what the truth is all about. I do not want you to be misinformed or, or uh, disillusioned about what things are going on or what things are going to take place. As you go through your news channels at night, yes, things are pretty dark out in the world. But the last time I checked, we are children of the light, not the darkness. The devil loves to use this disinformation. So it's easy to understand how God would flip the tables and come at this in the opposite direction with truth. Not just half-truths, but absolute truths is what Jesus Christ speaks. Now the things that we see unfolding on the world stage are absolutely horrific. And that's to say the least. You know, the recent invasion of Ukraine, the gas and oil price hikes, food and product shortages... The ongoing social tensions that's going on in the streets of many major cities of America. All these things are the places where fear could rise up in a person's heart if their eyes were not on the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said already in this passage, it says, be, be, I'm sorry, but see to it that you're not alarmed. He's giving us the warnings that these things must take place. Must, not might must take place, then the end will come. Jesus makes another interesting statement in verse 8, and it says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. As anyone has ever witnessed or experienced childbirth, this statement is very clear to each of us. Birth pains do not get better with time. They do not go away on their own. Birth pains become more frequent and more severe with time as the time for delivery approaches this slight pressure increases that was kidding thank you i did a little more research on verse 9 here i'm going to read it first and then go into what i found verse 9 says then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Persecution of Christians have been around as long as we've had Christians. Our Wednesday night crowds going through Acts chapter, I think we're 8 and 9. And we see the persecution of the church just unfolding in a massive rate. You know, this persecution is not new but what is new is how widespread that it has become and how horrific the acts against Christians now are. It has been estimated that more Christians are persecuted today than at any other time combined. According to opendoorusa.org, in 2021, over 360 million Christians living in place, are living in places where they experience a high level of persecution and discrimination. To put that in context, that's more than the United States population. This is worldwide. 360 million Christians are living in these states, in these areas where they are persecuted on a daily basis. 5,898 Christians were killed for their faith last year. 
5,110 churches and other buildings and church buildings were attacked. 4,765 believers were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Now these are just the numbers that we know about. I wonder how many more go unreported and unseen. Because many of these countries do not report these to the news outlets. One would think with all this persecution going on, it would cause the church of Jesus Christ to run and hide. But as we see in Acts chapters 3 and on, the persecution of the church did not dismantle the church. It breathed new life into the body. As we go through our history books, Christians that were persecuted did not hide. They thrived. They came out with more fire, more vigor, more zeal for the Lord. Because when the government and when the, uh, the, the government agencies say, you can't do this, you must stop doing this or I'll put you to death, the church rose up as we are right now, proclaiming the name of Jesus even more loudly than before. Amen. I'm thankful to see that not all churches are closing their doors. Not all churches are running and hiding. There are still a remnant church that is rising up from the ashes to let the people know that the Lord Jesus Christ is not on the cross. He is not in the grave. He is standing yeah. in heaven with all authority. Our God is not dead. And we will not pretend that he is. The Apostle Paul gave us some insight on what things will look like when the end is to come. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It is almost eerie how accurate how this description is about the world that we live in right now. Paul writes, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Here's the instructions. Have nothing to do with such people. If this passage does not describe the world we live in, right this second, I'm not quite sure if there's another one available. As we go through line by line, we can check every single box saying this is taking place right now. And it'd be awesome to be able to just check those boxes and say, yes, the government looks like this. The world looks like this. Social media looks like this. But unfortunately, those same things have crept into the church of Jesus Christ and corrupted our hearts. Whatever happened to holiness? Whatever happened to the dogmatic approach to God's worthiness of praise and His holiness? Call me old-fashioned if you want, but I'm pretty sure I remember a day when there was a difference, there was a distinction between the world and the church. The church body wasn't a social gathering event just once a week for an hour, then we go home and continue living the way the world lives. This book has changed the way I live my life, and I, my prayer is this is the same book that's changing your life on a daily basis. As we're going through this rat race called life, the cheese at the end is not free, church. It comes with a price, and it's going to cost you way more than you bargained for. So as we read through there in 2 Timothy there, Paul gave the who and the what of the story, but not the why. For the why of the story, go back to Matthew 24, and we'll pick up at verse 10 and read through 12. At that time, many will turn away from their faith and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Here's the why. Verse 12. Because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. 
These verses almost seem to contradict what I was talking about when the church is expanding globally because of the persecution. But in reality, all this does is paint a very clear picture of the war going on inside our hearts, where our souls hang in the balance. Church, it's time to pick your team, because the game clock is about to play out, and there will be no overtime. This falling away is not unfounded or only simple speculation. According to Gallup polls, the church's attendance has dropped substantially in the several years. In 1999, which doesn't seem that long ago, honestly, Gallup polls found that 70% of Americans attended church on a regular basis. 70%. And that same 70% floated around there for almost a century. 70 to 74% was the average for a long, long time. But something substantial took place thereafter. Because in 2018, that percentage goes from 70 to 50%. Half of Americans says, I don't go to church. I don't believe in God. I don't worship the one true Savior, Jesus Christ. Splitting our America, splitting our nation to a 50-50 divide. I wish I could tell you that's where it remained, but it has not. It has continued to fall away. In 2020, another poll was taken by Gallup, and it has found that 47% of America said they belong to a church, or a synagogue, or even a mosque. So now I don't really have the hard numbers about Christians. Because they lumped all these faith entities together. And they said 47% of Americans are all that's going because of their faith. It's numbers like this that cause a lot of us to lose hope, lose sleep, become disheartened and discouraged. And may even have fear sweep over our hearts about what's to come next. But the reason we are discussing all of these points today is not to cause panic, not to cause worry, but to bring light and truth to your life. The Bible is very clear on Jesus' other answer in verse 13. Because it gives us instructions, it gives us hope, and it gives us the direction that we need to have for our life. Verse 13 says, But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. If you have a pen or highlighter, you may want to underline that last part. Will be saved, church. Not might be. Might not could be. But will be saved as long as you remain steadfast. As long as you reside in Christ. God, our Father, will remain in you. Praise God. We must stay on the course. We must not lose heart. We have to keep our eyes focused on the cross of Jesus Christ, no matter what we face. See, God himself has given us a very, very, very powerful promise. And this promise has been repeated year after year, generation after generation. And that promise is that he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. We will never face anything that he cannot overcome. No matter how big and mighty and scary as the enemy may be, he is still God. Amen. God has repeating this, have been repeating this promise year after year. Reconfirming his commitment to the church. God told Abraham to trust and obey his instructions. In return, God promised to lead him and bless him. That happened, church. God also told Moses to trust and obey. In return, God promised to watch over and bless and provide, not just for him, but for the nation of Israel. God did that as well. God told Joshua to trust and obey and not fear, for he will be with him. He will see the victory. As you know, all of those things took place. Joshua has seen not just one victory, but victory upon victory everywhere he placed his foot because the Lord, God Almighty, did not leave him. The same as he has not left you and I in this room today. 
The same God that walked with the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace is the same God who closed the mouths of the hungry lions with Daniel. Is the same God that guided that rock into Goliath's forehead, killing him. That's the God that we serve. And we sometimes forget about the legacy that our God has. Now, if this was a new pop-up God that we never heard about with no track record, I understand that we can't trust him yet. But 6,000 years of examples and experience with our king, I think it gives him a little bit more substance. And we have no reason to fear. I know we're living in the last days. I'm not denying that fact. But we do not have to live in fear. Things may get scary. It may get a little rough. It may get tight now and then. But God filled oil jars over and over and over just to fill a lady's pocketbook so she can pay her bills. Do we really need to worry about the things that are going on on Main, on Main Street or Wall Street or anything else with our God still on the throne? Well, we don't need to worry. The unshakable truth is he's still on the throne, church. We need to stop playing like he's not there. The enemy may come to our door and start barking at us and growling and snarling his teeth and showing his claws. They may do that all day long. But the lion of the king of Judah will come back with a roar and a shout to take us home. Jesus said himself, I will be with you to the very end of the age. That was his promise as he departed the, the, the disciples on the mountain that day. I will never leave you. But this fear that rises up in our hearts sometimes pops up like a surprise storm now and then. In Mark chapter 4, it tells the account of Jesus wanting to go on a little boat ride after a long day of ministry. He was exhausted and fell asleep in the bottom of the boat. He's like, i got to take a nap, guys. And while Jesus slept in the boat, a violent storm arose, tossing the boat left and right and up and down. Waves crashed into the boat and, and threatened to capsize it. The disciples that were on board that day did not realize who was on board that day. Did not understand. Kind of like what we do. We don't understand who's leading our ship. Mark four thirty eight. it says, Teacher, don't you care that we drown? This is the cry of the church of Jesus Christ. When we lose focus on who's in the, in, on the throne... We think we're going to drown. We think we're going to be, you know, tossed left and right and thrown out to the sea. But the same Jesus that was on the boat that day is still on the throne. And when they woke him up, his answer was so powerful. He spoke to the waves, the wind. He says, knock it off. Peace be still. Maybe some of you guys need to hear those words today from Jesus himself. The storms that you're going through in life, they may be scary. They may be crashing down. They may look like they're going to kill you and destroy your life. But the book says, peace, be still. Church, you need to hear those words over and over again. I know that we see things going on in this world that scares us, that brings fright to our hearts. But peace be still. This is the unshakable truth of Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing is changing about the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what we face in life, we never face it alone. You guys don't have this in the back, but I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to pick up on verse 18. I'm going to close this message a different way. I just felt that the Lord's leading me this direction. This is the great commission that Jesus Christ set out for his disciples. This is also 
The mission statement of our church, in case you were wondering what our mission statement was. Verse 18 begins, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. There is nothing that is outside of the control of God. And I don't care who's in the White House, who's in Congress, who's in the Supreme Court. I don't care on any of those things that they think that they can overthrow my king. This king that we talk about, Jesus Christ, has power and authority. And the great thing is, he's not stingy with his power and authority. He's given it to his church. All authority has been given to you and I. And we should be able to pull down strongholds and principalities of the air, tear down demonic oppressions and possessions on people's lives. Verse 19 continues, says, Therefore go. I like the word therefore. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And here's the promise. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The reason why Satan is barking at the church's door as much and as loudly as he is, because he is terrified that the church might grab a hold of this right here and go do the work of the Lord. That, that thriving of the church around the globe from the persecuted people. The, the harvest is white right now. It is so ripe. It is ready to be harvested. The Lord's looking for willing people to go out. In the face of the storm, in face of the chaos, and in, in face of the enemy snarling and gnashing his teeth, to walk with boldness and authority say, shut up. Shut up, devil. This last week, I think it was almost every day this week, God has woke me up with a spiritual dream. And every single one of them is the church facing a demonic oppression, trying to get us to be fearful or stop us from speaking or stop us from going places. That's not going to happen, church. As long as the Lord Jesus Christ is still on the throne, we will go. We will go with boldness and authority because he sent us out and the promise therein. I'll be with you. You're not going by yourself. He's going with us. So this lies from the enemy. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it dismay your heart. Go back to the unshakable truth found in his holy word and reside with Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the encouragement that you're giving your church. Father, we do not we do not even think about retreating to giving up. Father, you've already given us the victory. So Lord, I pray right now that you help this church to hear your voice every single day. That we move by the beat of your drum. That Lord, your heartbeat leads us. And it may take us to places that we're uncomfortable with. But Father, we go with boldness and determination knowing that you are still on the throne. You are still with us. And Lord, no matter what we hear in the world, let us come back to the unshakable truth found in your holy word. And let us see the victory now in America and around this world. Father, I thank you for overturning Roe v. Wade. Lord, what a blessing that is. We thank you, Father. And now, God, I pray for the women who feel that their baby, Father, was a mistake. I pray, Lord, the church of Jesus Christ will rise up, will love on mommy and baby, will show them compassion, to show them guidance, will pour the love of Christ into their lives. I thank you, God, for being with us. I thank you, God, for lifting this curse off of this land. Let it be the first step of many to come for America to get their head back on straight with you. It's not about a political movement, Father. It's about a supernatural, a spiritual movement of God changing the hearts of mankind. I thank you, Father, for loving us even when we are unlovable. Send us out now, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.